welcome back to this afternoon session of the International Dialogue on Migration. And in this super exciting panel, we are going to be discussing advancing socioeconomic rights and the access to services in the COVID-19 era and beyond. And this builds on the discussion we had this morning um, regarding the impact of COVID on, on, my, on mobility. And there are just three um, pieces of information I, I'd like to share with you all to really frame the discussion that we're going to have. So did you know that over 200 countries last year issued over 110,000 COVID-related restrictions on travel and other measures um, nationally? Um, and that the UN estimates that we will have almost 100 million people going back, falling back into poverty. This is the first time we've seen a global increase in poverty in over 20 years. And did you know that the World Bank predicted that there would be a 20% drop in remittances, but in reality, we only saw a slight dip of a little over 2% in remittances. And that really speaks to the role that migrants play and have been playing in, um, the, recovery, in the recovery from COVID. So I'm, I'm joined by five very distinguished panelists who I will soon hand over to, but there are just a few things that I would um, like to highlight to further frame our discussion, uh, our discussion today. The first of which is COVID-19 threatens to undo many, many years of progress made towards inclusive and equitable services and, and broader sustainable development. Apart from um, COVID having pushed um, hundreds, um, over a hundred million back into poverty, there, it has also pushed millions out of education, decent work, and into hunger, malnourishment, and, well, undernourishment, and this is particularly affecting migrants and other disadvantaged groups. And then if you look at health in particular, um, the pandemic has really highlighted the vulnerabilities of migrants and their access to services, which has resulted in negative health outcomes. We've also seen and panelists um, in the session this morning talked about um, xenophobia, discrimination, and stigma against migrants in the context of COVID. And this really underscores the importance of advocacy as a counter to this. And we've also seen that social distancing measures in countries have really led to the creation of alternative ways of engaging and interacting with people through digital, through digital platforms, um, hotlines for the provision of information, provision of counseling and psychosocial support virtually and overall community outreach. So um, th this really, shows how COVID has been a disruptor, but it's not only been a disruptor, it has, it has forced um, countries, individuals, communities to adapt. Um, it, has, it has highlighted resilience that exists within communities, but also at the same time, there's still a lot to be done to address the inequities that have, um, that, that COVID unfortunately has not only highlight, highlighted and exacerbated. And let's not um, forget that in the Global Compact on Migration, we have a specific objective to ensure access to basic services for migrants, as well as to achieve inclusive social cohesion um, for migrants. So this is part of the broader global, um, global agenda on migration. And so with that, I'm pleased to, I'm very pleased to introduce the first speaker. And the, I, there's a personal connection here. Before 
um, joining IOM, I, um, I was in Jordan and um, very proudly received my vaccination in Jordan and not because I was a diplomat, but actually Jordan was non-discriminatory in how they provided access to the vaccine um, for, their, uh, for their population and all of those within, within Jordan. So um, with that, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Bassam Al Damshe, Damshe, who is the Governor Director of Nationality, Foreign Affairs and Investment at the Ministry of Interior for the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, a position he's had since 2016. He will present the perspective and experience of the government of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan in the context of the post-COVID and recovery efforts to ensure that no one is left behind, showcasing multi-sectoral cooperation and Jordan's whole of government approach. I understand that he's connected online. He's connected, we have a problem with translation. Can we just then move from number two? Because I just heard that we have a problem with uh, the translation. Uh, the speaker, the speaker. Apologies, colleagues, there's a slight change in the order of the panelists. Um, so now I will introduce our second speaker, Ms. Bola Bardet, and she is the founder and chief executive officer of SUSU, a startup providing healthcare services to African diaspora, looking to offer the best quality of care to their families back home. SUSU's and services include preventive health care, medical coverage in country and abroad, and assistance services. Bola is an executive MBA graduate from HEC in Paris, a chartered financial analyst from the CFA Institute, and also a graduate of the entrepreneurship program at Babson College in San Francisco. She will share her experience with advancing migrants' access to healthcare according to the right to health in line with universal coverage principles. Bola, over to you. Thank you. Um, I will switch to French because I will be uh, more comfortable in French. Uh, donc, uh, bonjour à tous et merci pour l'invitation. Je suis vraiment honorée d'être ici. Euh, donc, je m'appelle Bola Bardet, je suis d'origine béninoise, un petit pays qu'on qu ne connaît pas beaucoup et qui est à côté du, du Nigeria. Et euh, bah, j'ai passé la moitié de ma vie euh, au Bénin euh, et l'autre moitié en Europe, la France, la Suisse où j'habite maintenant. Et euh, donc, Soussou est arrivé un peu de manière euh, accidentelle dans ma trajectoire de vie et de carrière, euh, parce qu'en 2017, euh, j'ai eu euh, un événement tragique dans ma vie, euh, donc le décès de mon papa, euh, qui était basé au Bénin, et euh, qui a eu un malaise, on va dire, euh, cardiaque, et malheureusement qu'on n'a pas été en mesure de sauver, euh, tout simplement parce que le, le pays n'était pas équipé pour, euh, pour le sauver. Donc, à ce moment-là, moi, j'avais une carrière plutôt, on va dire, tranquille, si j'ose dire. Euh, j'avais fait un peu de carrière corporate euh, dans le domaine euh, du luxe, ensuite dans le domaine bancaire. Et ensuite, j'avais créé une société de consulting, donc plutôt tranquille. Mais euh, cet événement a été, euh, on va dire, euh, le déclencheur de plusieurs questionnements chez moi. Euh, le principal questionnement étant, euh, lorsqu'on est membre de la diaspora africaine, on, on dit souvent migrant, bon, c'est un terme que moi j'aime pas beaucoup, parce qu'il a toujours une connotation un peu péjorative, bon, je préfère dire diaspora africaine. Quand on est membre de la diaspora africaine, euh, donc qu'on a euh, en général euh, consenti à beaucoup de sacrifices, pour partir de chez soi, pour quitter ses proches qu'on aime beaucoup et qu'on travaille et qu'on se prive pour les aider. Comment on peut se retrouver dans une situation d'impuissance 
vis-à-vis -vis de ses proches lorsqu'il s'agit de la santé. Euh, lorsqu'on regarde en fait euh, ce qui est à la disposition de la diaspora en ce qui concerne la santé de leurs proches, donc ceux qui sont restés au pays, on se rend compte que c'est quasiment le désert et que la seule chose qu'ils ont à disposition, c'est les services de transfert d'argent. Malheureusement, ces services de transfert d'argent ne permettent pas de s'assurer que euh, l'argent envoyé euh, sert à améliorer euh, la santé des proches, tout simplement. Il ne garantit pas que les proches ont accès à des médicaments euh, non contrefaits, qui sont une plaie euh, dans nos pays africains. Il ne garantit pas euh, que les proches ont accès à de l'assurance. C'est assez basique à dire, mais quand on vit en Suisse ou en France, l'assurance, c'est un droit, c'est une couverture maladie euh, qui est universelle. Malheureusement, quand on est indi un individu lambda euh, en Afrique subsaharienne, et en particulier au Bénin, euh, l'assurance n'est malheureusement pas accessible, euh, à moins d'être un diplomate ou de travailler dans une grosse structure, etc., et donc, c'est un problème, donc un problème de financement de la santé euh, des proches. Il ne garantit pas non plus, donc encore une fois, le transfert d'argent ne garantit pas euh, non plus que mes parents vont dans les hôpitaux euh, qui sont euh, de qualité, euh, qu'il y a une prise en charge qui est effective en cas d'urgence. Donc, on se rend compte que voilà, on envoie de l'argent et finalement, on prie qu'il soit bien utilisé. Et, et donc, c'est à ça que j'ai essayé de, de, pallier, de pallier à ce problème, à ces, ces problèmes que je viens d'exposer, que j'ai essayé de pallier en créant Soussou, donc qui est, se présente comme euh, un abonnement hein, auquel euh, les membres de la diaspora africaine peuvent euh, souscrire euh, pour une année, pour le compte de un ou plusieurs bénéficiaires qui sont désignés dans leur pays d'origine. Et ça donne droit donc, à ces bénéficiaires euh, à une combinaison de services d'assurance, euh, de services d'assistance, à un suivi personnalisé également, parce que parfois l'assurance ne suffit pas quand on a des proches qui sont euh, vulnérables, qui sont vieillissants, qui souffrent de maladies chroniques, ce qui est le cas de la majorité des personnes de plus de 50 ans euh, en Afrique subsaharienne. Et, et donc, voilà, c'est cette combinaison-là qui, en fonction de l'état du proche, donc on fait d'abord un screening si j'ose dire, de l'état du proche. Et en fonction de son état, on va le diriger vers une, un set de services, un package de services qui vont permettre de financer les soins, de leur donner accès à, à, à un réseau médical de qualité, de leur donner accès également euh, à parfois des infirmiers qui vont à domicile pour, euh, pour les soigner, euh, à, à des call centers pour euh, en fait, répondre à toutes les questions qu'ils peuvent avoir, pour prévenir également, parce que la prévention est clé, dans la santé. Et donc, c'est ce set de services euh, qu'on qu qu met à disposition de la diaspora aujourd'hui. Euh, donc, euh, aujourd'hui, on est présent en Côte d'Ivoire, donc en France et en Côte d'Ivoire, et on est en train de se développer dans de nouveaux pays d'Afrique, le Sénégal, euh, le Cameroun, pour commencer, et encore d'autres pays en 2022. Euh, donc, voilà ce que je peux dire. Je pourrais donner plus de détails par la suite. Um, thank you very much, Bala, for such an inspirational story and your ability to turn um, what was a personal tragedy into uh, uh, an achievement that reaches so many people. So, so thank you for that. And now uh, moving on to the next um, speaker, and I, I, I'd really like to emphasize um, how important the inclusion of migrants is for service provision as a backbone of global commitments to leave no one behind and achieve the 2030 agenda. And so with that, I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Jeremy Robbins, who is the Chief Executive Officer of New American Economy, a bipartisan coalition of more than 500 CEOs and mayors making the economic case for immigration reform. He previously worked as a policy advisor and special counsel in the office of New York City Mayor, Michael Bloomberg. He will share his experience of the organization which he leads to promote migrant inclusive societies as well as his expertise in local migrant integration. Jeremy, over to you.
Thank you, Deputy Director Daniels and, and IOM for having me today. I'm honored to be part of such a distinguished group convened by such an important institution. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't join in person, um, but I'm thrilled to be able to be there virtually from my kitchen counter here in Brooklyn, New York. Um, uh, my name is Jeremy Robbins. I'm the Executive Director of New American Economy, uh, which is a US-based think tank and advocacy organization founded by then New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg to make the economic case for smarter immigration policies in the United States. Um, as an organization, we study the impact that immigrants are having in every single community in the United States and across every industry. And then we work directly with communities from the ground up to help them adopt concrete strategies and policies to attract, welcome, and support the immigrants who reside there. Uh, we're now working in 100 communities. Almost all of them are new immigrant gateways in conservative states across the US. Uh, and we're standing up locally driven efforts to resettle refugees, to help immigrants obtain citizenship, get access to benefits and services, to learn English, to thrive economically, civically, and socially. And um, this work has never been um, more important, uh, more challenging, or had more impact than during the current COVID-19 pandemic. Um, when COVID-19 hit, we immediately set up a data portal to analyze and publicize the role that immigrants were playing on the front lines in fighting the virus and keeping our economy afloat. Um, at the time, uh, we, were, we were fighting a wave of xenophobia, right? Immigrants were accused as being the cause of the pandemic, right? Our, we had a president who repeatedly referred to it as the China flu. Uh, and, and so we thought it was important to, to really highlight what was actually happening on the front lines. And um, immigrants in the United States, as in many places around the world, uh, tend to gravitate at both ends of the educational spectrum. So they're far more likely than native born to lack a high school diploma and work in the labor intensive industry, industries on the front lines. Um, but they're also far more likely to have a graduate degree and drive our STEM workforce. And, and on that latter point, you see it everywhere you look from the, the immigrants to the United States that were behind the successful COVID vaccines at Moderna and Pfizer uh, to the immigrant who invented Zoom so we could have uh, this meeting today where I could participate from Brooklyn. Um, so here's what we learned about the role immigrants were playing on the front lines. Though they make up just around 13% of the entire U.S. populations, uh, immigrants play hugely disproportionate roles in U.S. healthcare. Uh, they account for more than 36% of all home health aides, nearly 30% of all doctors, and more than 30% of all psychiatrists that were caring for our, our physical and our mental health as we were fighting the virus. Um, they were also working in the riskiest jobs that proved essential for keeping our economy afloat and keeping our food system from breaking. Roughly half of immigrants work in essential industries. In California, where roughly half of the United States produce comes from, immigrants account for two out of every three workers in the agriculture industry. Nationwide, there are more than half of all people working in food packing jobs. Um, and you see it up and down the supply chain from the truck drivers who are transporting goods and services to the cashiers keeping our essential retail and grocery stores open, uh, to the sanitation workers doing the essential work cleaning and sterilizing to keep the virus at bay, immigrants play and continue to play disproportionately large roles in all of the important and risky jobs that our society depended and continues to depend on. Um, but for the very same reason uh, that immigrants were such a vital part of our COVID response, they were also the most vulnerable to get the virus. Immigrant communities were far more likely to, to get COVID and far less likely to receive government economic and health benefits to weather the pandemic. Um, and so that, that created a real uh, difficult situation for communities that, that wanted to have inclusive recoveries, that wanted to help their most vulnerable uh, and wanted to make sure that they helped all their citizens. And so with the help of the Walmart Foundation, we conducted a five city, 2000 resident COVID-19 impact survey to measure this disparate treatment and to help communities understand how could you craft an inclusive recovery. Um, and what we learned was sobering, though perhaps not unexpected. Immigrants reported enormous direct impacts to their economic well being from COVID 19. One in three had their hours reduced or lost their job. Half of very low in Im income immigrants didn't receive any stimulus checks from the, the federal government. Um, and even when services or, or benefits were technically available, there are huge barriers to obtaining them. And, and we found that lack of information, fear of bias attacks, Concern about immigration status were the top barriers to accessing, accessing necessary services like medical care. Um, importantly, immigrants also experienced a severe sense of dislocation from the pandemic. 80% of the immigrants we surveyed reported negative impacts on their sense of safety, well being, and belonging, 80% due to the pandemic. 
Um, and that included suffering from mental health issues, isolation, and, and other things of that sort. Um, on the positive front, uh, relating it to our, our message today, there's also a lot of evidence to show that cities and local partners stepped in. So 60% of immigrant respondents said they knew a local organization they could turn to for help. 42% had received food assistance from a local nonprofit or, or local government, and 12% had received rent or mortgage assistance. Um, and so, so working with these cities and, and through the, the New American Economy Cities Index that, me, that, we, that we run every year that measures how well immigrants are in, integrating in cities across the United States, um, we were able to tease out several common key actions that cities were taking to promote inclusive emergency management um, and to help provide a guide, I think, for cities going forward. So uh, there, there were six different things that cities were doing that, that proved effective. Um, first, cities like Boston created community-driven multi-sector task forces on inclusive emergency management uh, to ensure that immigrants and all relevant stakeholders were at the table from the design phase and crafting what the pandemic response was gonna be. Um, other cities like Long Beach, California, actually formalized our task forces by having a dedicated equity team or office embedded within the emergency operation structure so that whenever there's an emergency response, there's someone whose job it is to focus on inclusivity. Um, another big one was language. So several cities, including Tulsa, Oklahoma, developed emergency language access plans that included things like live interpretation of briefings, databases of, of which city staff speak different languages, uh, hotlines in multiple languages, uh, flyers that are translated in multiple languages, and other methods to make sure that language was not a barrier to obtaining city services and relief. Um, most of the cities that, that proactively sought to build inclusive recovery, cities like, like Minneapolis, Minnesota, or Seattle, Washington, actually formalized the partnerships and funding uh, and coordination with immigrant community leaders. So they had programs like community navigator programs where there'd be a dedicated person in each community who would be the leader to, to share key info and collect feedback. Um, other cities that focus on things like medical care, so places like Albuquerque, New Mexico, local governments provided free or low cost access to medical care regardless of immigration status. Uh, so including testing, vaccination, emergency treatment, things to ensure that, that when we're responding, we're responding as a community. Um, and finally, and most difficultly, but I think in some ways most importantly, a few cities like New Orleans, Louisiana, were able to create resiliency funds. Uh, so in the US, our, our federal government had an emergency response to COVID, but it, but it made immigration status part of the, the requirements to get relief. Uh, and so undocumented immigrants were, were, were left out of that. And so certain cities like New Orleans were able to use either private funds or public private funds uh, to support undocumented workers and families. Um, so the survey results and all of our COVID-19 data is available on the New American Economy website. And I can put that in the chat for the people who are on Zoom. Um, but it also includes very useful tools I think could be replicated around the world. Things like our, our interactive map, which is mattheimpact.org, uh, which shows how immigrants impact each and every single community across the entire United States. Uh, you can put in your local address and see what the economic impact is in your community. Um, or our cities index that I mentioned, which, which measures using 50 different metrics, how well all large cities are doing it at immigrant success and integration. Um, so I'm grateful for the opportunity to discuss this work with you today and, and really appreciate having me. So thank you all. Um, thank you very much, Jeremy, particularly for quantifying um, the contribution of migrants, but also demonstrating what inclusive um, an inclusive COVID response um, looks like. And really great that, um, uh, that you have tools which are um, replicable. Um, thank you also for calling out my name at the beginning because that reminds me that I didn't actually introduce myself. I know Amy did at the beginning, but I think I need, <laughs> I need to do that. Um, so my name is Ugochi Daniels. I'm the new Deputy Director General for Operations at IOM. And uh, apologies for not introducing myself earlier, but better late, better late than never. So um, now we're moving on to a joint presentation um, by Mr. David Kudur, the Human Mobility Advisor at UNDP, and, and my dear colleague, Cecile Rayon, the head of the Migration and Sustainable Development Division here at, um, well, no, we're not in IOM, at IOM. Um, and first to start, I understand is David, 
who prior to his current role as the Human Mobility Advisor at UNDP, worked as the Regional Migration Advisor at the Regional Center for Latin America and the Caribbean in Panama. And before that, he worked as the Advisor for Migration and Development at the UNDP office in Colombia. So David, over to you. Thank you, uh, DDG Daniels. It's, uh, it's an honor to be uh, with you. I hope you can uh, hear me uh, well. Um, so I, I was already here one year ago together with Cecile and we were already talking about our joint uh, collaboration. And, and after one year of working together, uh, we have uh, made uh, significant progress and uh, I'm very happy to share that and, and, and also the lessons we have learned in terms of uh, precisely the topic of this panel on uh, access to services and, and, and issues of, uh, of integration. I think that the premises of our joint collaboration between IOM and UNDP that we believe that uh, migration and migrants uh, are key uh, contributors to the sustainable development of their countries of origin, transit, and destination. And this is really where our joint work and our support to the member states um, make, uh, make sense. We are very active in the UN network on migration, precisely co-leading the work and supporting the, the, support, supporting the, the member state in their implementation of the, the global compact. And most importantly, since last year, we have implemented a, a seed funding initiative to support um, our countries, country offices and the countries in providing a response, a socioeconomic response to COVID-19 for migrants and communities. We implemented this initiative in 11 countries across regions. And um, we, we hope, we believe that this initiative has been uh, very uh, useful to support the, the migrants. We have been working in Lesotho, in uh, Indonesia, in Kyrgyzstan, in uh, Peru, Costa Rica, uh, sorry, um, in Peru and El Salvador and so on and so forth. And, and we have had so much good feedback that we decided to uh, launch a new round of support to the countries uh, because unfortunately, after one year and a half, we are still facing the consequences of, uh, of COVID-19 and the migrants have been particularly hit hard as it had been reminded by the previous speakers. And, and congrats to Jeremy for a great uh, initiative and a great uh, presentation. Um, we have learned some lessons over, over the last year and a half. And I think that the main one is that why migrants have been particularly hit hard. The reason is that they are structurally more vulnerable. It's not that they have been more vulnerable in a context of pandemic. They have been more vulnerable because there is a lack of integration. So we have also learned about the cost of no integration. And it's very important to use this experience to uh, project ourselves in the future. And how can we prevent in the future that migrants are losing their jobs so quickly, are more uh, prone to uh, get sick, to get uh, uh, to, to, to be uh, exposed to the vaccine to the virus more quickly than the other part of the population. Um, why don't they benefit from uh, social protection support or social safety net? So we need to ask the right questions and to provide the right uh, answers. Um, it, it's very important, I think, to understand in a context where there is such a negative connotation on migrants, as was uh, reminded by uh, Mrs. Bardet, um, it's, it's very important to remind that first migrants contribute to uh, economies and, and societies, but that we all benefit from integrating them into our societies. We benefit because as we all know, if uh, there is a spread of the virus and uh, all the societies affected, it's not just the migrants uh, being uh, uh, affected, but all the society is exposed. If they lose their jobs and they cannot consume anymore, they fall into poverty, but they also stop consuming. They also stop contributing to the uh, economies. Uh, and, and therefore, we, we need to think collectively. Migrants contribute, 
They are also more vulnerable. Therefore, we need to provide long-term solutions to migrants, but all the society uh, benefits from that. And, and that's something which is uh, really uh, key. And, um, and I insist a lot on that because apparently still, this is a message that we need to, uh, to provide. So uh, we need to see integration efforts, access to services, access to health, access to social protection, access to uh, job protection and employment benefits, not as a burden for the host countries, but really as an investment. Uh, and, and this is really, I think, uh, one of the main lessons of uh, all this uh, period of, uh, of COVID-19. We need to uh, also invest in host communities. We cannot uh, keep repeating that migrants uh, matter, that uh, we need to invest in, in migrants' rights and uh, access to services if we don't take into account what is happening in terms of uh, xenophobia, discrimination, the bad perceptions about the migrants. So we also need to involve the communities, host communities, in a way that they feel that uh, really, they, be, they benefit from this uh, migrants' contribution, and it's key, and you mentioned that in your opening remarks, uh, that we also uh, promote social cohesion um, as, a, as a key uh, factor for making migration work for sustainable development. And in this dynamic, we need to articulate better also the efforts at the national level, with those at the local level. And, and Jeremy was mentioning some uh, very good examples in the US. And, and precisely my colleague, uh, Cécile Rialan from IOM, is going to explain how this uh, connection between national and local and, and the role of local actors to better provide access to, to services. So thanks and over to you, Cécile. Thanks a lot, David. Um, so, Billy, indeed, I'd like to bring us back to, to the local level and very much build on the, on the great comments that uh, Jeremy Robbins made, and as well as some of the lessons learned that, uh, that uh, David was, was explaining earlier, coming from, from a partnership in the context of the seed funding and other global programs that we're implementing around the world. So I think it's been really interesting to see that cities were faced really firsthand with this paradox uh, on the really seeing the migrants being at the forefront of delivering services to local population during the pandemic. Uh, and this has been said many times, while at the same time seeing that those same migrants were really the one facing problems accessing those services and really seeing it firsthand what the consequences of that is not only on the migrant population themselves, but on the entire community, really creating serious issues in terms of health, in terms of social and economic outcomes for the whole community. So what is it that we, what we've learned and what we see has been done around the world? And I think it was really interesting to hear from Jeremy, you know, how much local and regional authorities and particularly cities in the United States have really mobilized themselves. But what has happened elsewhere around the world, because it is clear that not all cities have this reach or this ability to mobilize existing services and reach uh, to, the, uh, to, to migrants and take into account their specific vulnerabilities. And the good news is that we have been looking around the world and we have seen that these practices have happened in different parts of the world, including in the global south. And this is a work that, uh, that we have done uh, in particularly with the uh, Mayor's Migration Council, uh, to which IOM is a funding member. And we have documented, for example, that in cities like Beirut, uh, you know, they have been doing mobile COVID-19 testing centers to reach people uh, in hard to reach parts of the city and really look, you know, reaching out to displaced to migrant population. We have, in, we have seen cities uh, really also in cash assistance to local population at large, making sure that undocumented migrants will be able to also access. So if I have to bring us back to one of the main lessons learned and what, can, what has united a lot of those practices in the global south, in the global north at local level, is that cities have made a very clear decision. That is, to provide equal access to services for all, regardless of migratory status. And, and I think that, that, is, that is a very important part of what we have to be looking at when we talk about access to services for migrant population. So really by doing so, uh, a number of cities really have stepped up to their role in addressing widening inequalities 
within local population and between you know, different parts of this local population, migrants being an important part of that. So the importance of the local level to get things right cannot be underlined enough. It is at the local level where inclusion and service provision takes place. It is at the local level that, what, that where a better understanding of the needs and opportunities surrounding migration lie. It is also at the local level where mayors, local authorities, religious leaders, civil society organizations, the private sector really can work effectively together. But we know that it is not the whole picture. Indeed, implementing these solutions uh, is complex, particularly when local solutions contradict national level policies. So how do we reconcile that? Le local level intervention to be brought to scale also need to be supported by national authorities. So really COVID-19 more than ever has underlined the importance of having a true whole of governance approach. As an, and this is an essential element of the global compact on migration. So the UN network on migration, to which of course IOM and UNDP are, are very, in which we are closely cooperating, we have ensured that cities' voices are heard through the inclusion of city networks. And cities are also able to access funding through the Migration Multi-Partnership Trust Fund. IAM also supports the mayor's mechanism alongside with UCLG, a uh, very important city network, and the Mayor's Migration Council to raise the voices and expertise of mayors and local authorities in state-led and global discussions on migration. A call to local action will be issued shortly to link up city actions with the implementation of the Global Compact on Migration and the Global Compact on Refugees. Access to services, portability of social rights are essential elements of this call to local action. So IOM and UNDP, through our partnership, uh, we are actively engaging with national and local authorities all around the world. And I think David you know, mentioned some of, uh, some of those countries where we are actively working and really applying this whole of governance and whole of society approach in our joint work, really linking migration governance with local development, with city planning and service delivery for local populations at large. So we're really looking forward uh, to do more in strong partnership with all of you with migration and development practitioners at large, and hopefully maybe in a year from now, stand in front of you uh, to report on further results in this, in this journey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cecile. Thank you, David, um, for sharing IOM and UNDP's co-created solution to promote greater social cohesion between local communities, migrants, and refugees. Um, it was really, Good to hear David, you know, really capture the, that migrants contribute, that migrants are more vulnerable, um, the importance of integrating into society as an investment. I think that is a, uh, it, it's an, a really important perspective um, to, 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 to bear in mind, especially when we go back to the the, the earlier discussions around um, stigmatize, stigmatization and discrimination, but that actually this is an investment in society. Also for highlight, highlighting the role of host communities and a whole of government uh, or a whole of society approach and getting things right at the local level, particularly the, the portability of, of social rights and the engagement of all the various stakeholders. So with that, we have come to the end of our, um, our panel presentations. I understand that we have two statements from either online or on the floor. And if colleagues either in the room or online would like to ask questions or have any further statements, please indicate so. Um, and then um, I'll be able to call on you after these two statements. So the first statement will be from the representative from Portugal. Is it online or in the room? Good afternoon. Hello. Yes. Sir. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, you can. Can you see me? 
and we can see you. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi. Uh, many thanks for this opportunity, and I would like to thank the insight, the insights from the speakers and the perspectives from different countries, which is very important for us. So um, I'm the State Secretary for Integration and Migration, and I would like also to give the perspective of Portugal. Um, so as you said, and in Portugal, the pandemic crisis has increased the long-standing inequalities. And so it made them more visible and affected, as we all know, more people in vulnerable situations, including uh, migrants. And now our step is exactly what is the, the title of this panel, is to make temporary measures to, to transform them and make them public measures, public permanent measures. So that's what we have been working for. Um, and in that sense, we are trying to improve uh, um, the access to mainstream services uh, through better information and the removal of barriers. Secondly, uh, together with the government and I, Commissioner for Migration, we are trying. We are always working for that the migrants have access to the same rights that any Portuguese citizen has. And so, what have we learned from the crisis in that sense? And this was also a challenge, but at the same time, as you said, an opportunity. Uh, the global compact of migration, which we started just some months before pandemic. Uh, uh, was very important to stress and to reinforce uh, all of society government approach. And that was very important to link the local government, local administration with the central administration and associations from the civil society. And I would like to stress four measures. First, the access to health. Uh, we, in the vaccination, uh, we included all the migrants who are documented and undocumented. And so we, how did we do this? We created a platform um, so that they could register um, the persons without the national health uh, um, uh, number. And at the same time, we created the open houses for vaccinations where we had persons to register migrants undocumented in the, in the system. And um, we tried, we worked very closely with the civil society so that everyone could reach this information and become vaccinated. And so now Portugal has reached 85% uh, of the population vaccinated, included migrants, both documented and undocumented. Uh, secondly, uh, when the pandemic started in March uh, 2020, we issued a decree and then we renew it to uh, regularization measures. So we temporarily regularized every migrant who had submitted um, their, uh, their process of residence permit. And this was very important. It was very important for the migrants and also for the, um, per the persons, the employers, who wanted to attribute them the layoff and only through these measures they could have the layoff, they could have social security support um, and other kinds of supports. Third, we, we revised the Portuguese language courses, making them more flexible and also that undocumented migrants could access the Portuguese language courses. And uh, lastly, to again stress that the global compact of migration was really important for our government. And we simplified procedures. For instance, the social security number. Now it's much easier for migrants to have this number. Uh, also the renewal of residence permits. Now it's much more simple. And so we simplified the, the procedures. Um, to end, just to say that um, exactly as also Jeremy Iron said and David, who do that the, um, the contribution of immigrants to society is very important. And in Portugal, in last, in last year, the contribution to the Portuguese social security from migrants was 884 million euros. So between, between what migrants, uh, migrants contributed and between what they received from the Portugal uh, social security system, the social security system benefited only from migrants, 
884 million euros. Uh, so this is a, a very important contribution to Portuguese society, also demographic, and this is an opportunity. And we, I also like to say that we don't have enough uh, workers for our labor market. So we really need migrants for our labor markets. And thirdly, we strongly value diversity in Portugal. So many thanks and uh, many thanks also for us to keep learning with uh, uh, all the speakers. Thank you very much. And congratulations to Portugal for the very high um, vaccination rate and also for highlighting that contribution to the social security system by migrants. Okay, next on my list, I have the representative of Bangladesh. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, first of all, Madam, I would like to congratulate you very warmly for being appointed as the direct, Deputy Director General for Operations of IOM. I also want to thank all the distinguished panelists for their very thought-provoking and insightful presentations. Um, their um, observations and their uh, findings were really very helpful to understand the situation, particularly in the uh, post uh, in the COVID context. <clears throat> Migrants remain very vulnerable during and after their movement because of a lack of sufficient protection measures at the national, regional, and global levels. This uh, situation often causes inadequate and unequal access to healthcare, decent jobs, and livelihood opportunities. The COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically increased the vulnerability of the uh, migrants in many places. Yet in uh, many places, they faced unequal access to healthcare, including COVID-19 vaccines. Thousands of migrant workers have without any guarantee of getting back those jobs. Uh, Bangladesh being a very migrant uh, in, intensive country, we have, uh, we have really millions of migrants outside. And so we, we faced a situation, uh, you know, uh, very uh, hard. Many of them uh, are facing the grim reality of forced return. The pandemic has indeed brought an uncertain future to millions of migrants from developing countries, including my own country, Bangladesh. Uh, Madam Moderator, uh, migrants are significant contributors to development in every society, and all the panelists have mentioned that. While preparing to build back, migrants will have to be part of the solution for a sustainable and inclusive recovery. And to this end, Madam Maideli, who has a few points uh, for your consideration. Uh, first, a rights-based approach focusing on migrants' health, job, and livelihood security is crucial. Second, national COVID-19 response programs of countries of destinations must include migrants. And all migrants, irrespective of their status, must get equal access to healthcare, including vaccines. Third, migrants who have lost their jobs must be guaranteed reappointment. Ethical recruitment and decent job is a key for protecting migrant workers across supply chains. And finally, Madam Moderator, private sectors and businesses need to play an essential role in protecting the rights of labor migrants, irrespective of their migratory status. I thank you, Madam, for the opportunity. Thank you very much and for the strong emphasis on the rights of, of migrants. And next on the list is the representative of Niger. Merci, Madame la Moderatrice. Eh, Permettez-moi tout d'abord de féliciter les panélistes pour leurs exposés très riches en informations. Eh, le Niger salue les choix de ce thème, promouvoir les droits socio-économiques et l'accès aux services pendant et après la pandémie, qui constitue un appel à l'action pour que la communauté internationale se relève des répercussions de la pandémie tant sur le plan sanitaire que socio-économique. 
En effet, la COVID-19 a eu des répercussions sanitaires et socio-économiques à raison des perturbations sur les systèmes sanitaires et éducatifs, les restrictions de voyage, la perte d'emploi et l'augmentation de la pauvreté. Et les réfugiés et les migrants, qui constituent l'une des couches sociales les plus fragiles, sont souvent plus affectés par les conséquences socio-économiques de la pandémie de COVID-19. En effet, nombreux parmi eux ont perdu leurs sources de subsistance et ont des difficultés à accéder aux services de base tels que la santé et l'éducation de leurs enfants. Et pour le Niger, l'inégalité d'accès des migrants et des réfugiés à des services de santé de qualité a des incidences négatives sur la santé publique générale et, et tranche avec la vision d'inclusivité défendue par l'ONU et l'écrasante majorité des membres de la communauté internationale de l'apparition de la pandémie. À cet égard, le Niger réaffirme ses vues selon lesquelles seule la solidarité internationale dépendant d'une vaccination universelle et l'inclusion de toutes les couches sociales, notamment les réfugiés, peuvent permettre de mettre fin à la pandémie et d'envisager la relance économique mondiale. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, and also for underscoring the importance of international solidarity, which we had also heard about in the first in the first panel. Next, the representative of the Council of Europe. We cannot hear you. No, we can't hear you. So maybe what I will do, I will go to the next speaker and then we will come back to you. Hopefully you would have been able to sort out your audio. And the next speaker is the representative of Japan. Oh, can you hear me? My line is not stable, so I'm just joining through my voice. Uh, um, thank you, Ms. DDG Daniels. Uh, inclusion of impartiality are critical elements in responding to the COVID, especially for vulnerable migrants. Uh, efforts such as health, border control, and reintegration need to ensure access to services for all, including migrants. In this regard, it is timely to this, uh, address these issues in this panel and the discussion here are very interesting and, and insightful. Japan attaches great importance to the uh, field of global health in order to improve human, human security. And it has taken a strong effort to achieve universal health coverage for many years. We recognize that COVID has greatly affected vulnerable people such as migrants and refugees, thus IOM's medical and health efforts are becoming more important than ever. COVID affects not only treatment capacity of infectious diseases, but also various healthcare systems in general. For example, pregnant women are at risk of infection of COVID. Therefore, appropriate services are necessary to minimize the risk. Therefore, Japan has introduced the telemedicine system in cooperation with Japanese companies and NGOs in Sierra Leone, one of the countries with the highest maternal mortality rate in the world, and carried out maternal examinations. Furthermore, in this project, we are working to strengthen the systems with the strong support of the medical staff of Sierra Leone diaspora. Apart from this, Japan is providing support to meet the urgent needs of people and COVID, especially in Africa, Middle East, and Asia, includes cooperation with IOM. This project covers mental health, psychological support, support migrants and host communities, strengthening of border control capabilities, reintegration of returnees. Furthermore, we are also implementing projects for economic recovery from COVID. Japan will con continue to meet the urgent needs of the countries with close cooperation and cooperation, uh, 
coordination and cooperation with IOM. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to extend uh, our congratulations and welcome uh, to the new IOM Deputy General Directors. Talking about uh, the pandemic, which was something that nobody expected and nobody planned anything related to, it hit the world in a very strong way. We started by taking actions of inc inclusiveness in the United Arab Emirates. We did not look at the migrant status. Are you staying legally in the country? Do you have the permits? But we looked at everybody as human beings. Dealing with the situation in this way, the government made sure that everybody has access to uh, testing at the beginning, uh, access to healthcare if needed. We also utilized technology to create platforms where people who, who, whose jobs are threatened would have chances to move within the labor market for different sectors that would have new job opportunities. Moving throughout the way with vaccines uh, being available, the UAE made sure that vaccines are available for everybody, UAE nationals, migrants, workers, and everybody coming to the country. Today, we are proudly saying that our vaccination rate is 170 doses per 100 uh, person, which is the highest in the world. Mo moving from the pandemic and looking at the recovery, we are working closely with our partners uh, to make sure that safe pathways are created, that opportunities are available for everyone who, has, who wants to come and work in the country and also that rights are protected as it, as, as it always has been. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And this brings us to the end of the statements and questions. Um, and thank you to all who, who provided statements or, or shared the experience from their, from their countries. And um, before I go back to our distinguished panelists for their final comments in response to the um, statements and contributions, I, I would just like to share with everyone that the contribution from the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan by Dr. Bassam will be available in writing and presented in the report of this um, IDM. And so with that, I'm going to go back to our back to our various panelists. So I think I'll start with Bola here um, for, your final, for your final comments or reactions or reflections. Um, donc, uh, merci encore uh, de, de me donner la parole. Uh, J'ai trouvé vraiment très, très, très intéressant les, les différentes interventions. Ce que, ce que je retiens en tout cas euh, de, de l'expérience qu'on a euh, avec, euh, avec Soussou, donc qui est euh, un service de santé permettant aux membres de la diaspora de, de couvrir la santé de leurs proches, c'est que finalement, euh, donc les migrants ou la diaspora doivent être pris, euh, on va dire, avec des besoins qui sont considérés dans leur ensemble, euh, nous, on a démarré aujourd'hui sur le domaine de la, la santé et à force d'échanger avec les membres de la diaspora, les associations de la diaspora, on, 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 on réalise qu'il y a d'autres besoins euh, qui, qui demandent à être, à être satisfaits en fait, de la diaspora. Euh, par exemple, il y a euh, l'aide au, au retour au, au pays, il y a également euh, le rapatriement euh, sanitaire euh, en cas d'urgence. Il y a cette question du transfert d'argent qui est extrêmement importante et qui est centrale lorsqu'on sait les volumes d'argent que représente euh, les, la migration, enfin les, les migrants pour leur pays d'origine, un pays comme le Sénégal, ça va être autour de 15% du PIB. Euh, on a vu l'impact euh, de, de certaines diasporas sur euh, la pandémie du, du Covid, qui ont été très solidaires, en, par exemple en envoyant de l'oxygène euh, dans leur pays d'origine, ce genre de choses. Donc, euh, on se rend compte que 
euh, bah, les migrants sont une vraie euh, richesse, effectivement, pour le pays euh, d'origine, euh, mais également pour euh, leur pays de résidence, et que euh, bah, en fait, leurs besoins doivent être considérés un peu dans l'ensemble, et, euh, et qu'ils ne doivent pas être considérés comme euh, des, euh, je sais pas comment dire, des, juste des, des personnes à aider ou qui sont juste dans le besoin. C'est une catégorie de population qui apporte énormément de la valeur euh, dans leur pays, euh, à la fois d'origine et de résidence. Voilà tout ce que je voulais dire. Thank you very much, Paula. And now I will go to Jeremy for your right. final reflections. Yeah, thank you. I'm so grateful to be able to be here today um, and to, to be with all of you. Um, I was struck by the commonality of, of what so many of the distinguished statements and, and panelists had to say that, that we really are facing something similar around the world and, and a real lack of investment and communication and, uh, and inclusivity. But, but, but I'll end on something that I think is, is quite optimistic and promising. Um, and I can speak only for the United States in this, but, but one thing that I was struck by in COVID-19 is that for the first time, Uh, it became really clear uh, what it meant to be an essential worker. And uh, it became clear the dialogue about, when we talked about immigration, people would focus on high-skilled immigrants and entrepreneurs, but, but almost the, the people who are working in labor-intensive industries, who are working in lower-skilled jobs, um, were, were almost dismissed as a, as a drag on, on our economic growth. And one, the one very big positive thing in how we think about our economy Uh, is that COVID laid clear, like who are the people without whom our economy stops? Um, and, and often it's, it's not the scientist or the doctor, although we need the doctors too and the scientists, but, but it's the person who's, who's cleaning, who's transporting, who's, who's assisting. And so um, I do think I am, I'm, I'm optimistic that as we think about policy and we think about resilience, we think about policy going forward, uh, that, that, that it, it is easier to make the case about why these investments are so important. Uh, and so I'm hopeful that, that there has been a learning experience and uh, certainly dialogues like this are extremely helpful in, in sharing that. So, so thank you for having me today. It is a, a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And now I will go to David for his um, final reflections. Thanks so much. Uh, no, I was uh, very impressed. There are so many uh, initiatives, you know. I am, I'm, today I am in Washington, D.C., first uh, in-person mission for quite a long time. I am at the MPI, the Migration Policy Institute, where we will discuss the questions of uh, integration for um, people from, uh, from Venezuela in Colombia and the, the region. And, uh, and I see one of the topics we are going to discuss is Uh, how can we use the experiences from the rest of the world? And I think that there are so many experiences. And I, I really believe that the role of this kind of event like today and uh, the role we have as uh, UN agencies is also to help uh, member states connect the dots and uh, not just presenting, but how can we better use these experiences? What uh, the, the lessons learned from uh, what uh, Jeremy was mentioning in uh, US cities, the experience of Portugal, who is amazing, uh, the experience of the UAE and so on and so forth. Um, how can we do that better? We are going to just uh, release a, a UN network on migration discussion paper on precisely um, the, the social economic consequences of COVID-19 on migrants and communities. And, and why integration matters. And there are lots of lessons, but, but how can we make that we can support better the countries, that uh, we can help them uh, facing these uh, situations, not reinventing the wheel. I often feel that every time we are facing a new situation, we are reinventing the wheel instead of using all these uh, good practices. So uh, hopefully this dialogue can, uh, can help Uh, and, and also, of course, uh, our agencies, IOM, UNDP, and, and the other UN agencies to, to support the member states in a, in a better way. And um, so that indeed uh, we can uh, help uh, make migration work better for sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you, David. And now, last but certainly not the least, over to you, Cecile, for your reflections. Thanks a lot. 
Um, I think a key, a key element that, was, uh, that came out of our discussions in this panel is that really investing in migrants equal investing in our societies at large. Um, so there's definitely a silver lining in this, uh, in this pandemic uh, that has really brought to the fore the visibility of, uh, of migrant workers as essential members of our societies. Without migrant workers, our societies cannot function. So it is, there is really there a tremendous opportunity to, to shift the, the debate on migration and, and really put to the fore some critical policy issues in a mobile world about you know, how do we ensure portability of social rights? How do we ensure equal, universal access to health? These are the critical issues, hopefully, uh, that this pandemic has brought to our attention. And going back to what David was saying about the role uh, of the UN and how we can best support uh, our member states, I think definitely we've heard amazing and really interesting and important uh, practices and initiatives from governments, from, from local and regional authorities, from cities, but a lot of those are really taking place in the global north. And we know very well that the magnitude of migration is really perceived in the global south. So what is it that we need to do to really mobilize ourselves to be working with cities, to be working with governments in the global south to make sure that all those elements we've been talking about, access to services, I really meant, you know, really brought as, a, as an important consideration. And doing this, not so much thinking of vulnerabilities of migrants only, but looking at it from a whole of, of society approach, understanding that in those societies, there are multiple vulnerabilities. So how do we integrate you know, this dimension of migration of human mobility within those specific uh, developing contexts. So maybe just something for us to say that where we need to really put uh, more emphasis moving forward uh, as international community. Thank you. Thank you, Cecile. And thank you very much once again to our panelists. Um, I don't know about all of you, but certainly for me, I'm, I'm leaving this discussion feeling very positive. We've certainly heard about how inclusion of migrants in the response is not just the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing, you know, it's the smart thing to do. We've had very positive examples um, from around the world on, on how this is done. And also we've heard, you know, country um, testimonies from the country level on the significant contributions migrants make to their, to their economies. So in, in summary, you know, migrants are part of the solution and a key actor in the in a whole of society approach to, to sustainable development. So I think the call to all of us here in the different capacities and roles that we have is how we work together to take this learning, to take this experience forward. How do we scale it up? How do we amplify it? And how do we support um, member states in, in achieving this. And so um, with that, I look forward very much to working all of you, working with all of you and supporting all of you in, in bringing this to, to reality um, across the globe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Director General. And I would like to invite uh, Jeffrey Labovich to come over to the panel as we are closing this panel and we are opening another one. And I would like to invite him to come over.